so as a singer, we, we're given words to, to, to tell a story. So as a pianist, do you have a story in your head of how you think that the journey of the piece is? Is that, is that you know, do you, do you each take a, a, the same piece? And it'd be interesting to say, you know, you all play one sonata, and what you all think that sonata is saying. Do you have a, do you have a journey, like we have journeys with words through a piece of a, of a, a scenario, or a, I mean, maybe I'm not being very clear with it, or do you do you do that? I, I think, uh, by all means, you need to have a, um, a kind of a, a logical construction in your head. It doesn't have to be always a story, like he did this and he went to the forest and he met the wolf and then, you know, and got eaten. Um, you, you, you don't have to have this kind of story, but you... Um, and some people actually don't think in terms of continuous storylines, they might be thinking about even the colors mm. that go through. Some people are more um, thinking about kind of lines or constructions, even you know, sort of mm. geometrical uh, figures. But um, it, it can happen too. Uh, but you need to build up a, a concept of the piece, how the piece develops. And I think often, it, um, if the, there isn't one, then the structure of the piece uh, can collapse. Um, uh, and often, for example, it, if you didn't think about how the process of development of that, you don't actually know where the, the strong point is, you know, where the climax point, and then you can't work out how do you get there. You've actually got to build a, a story, but not necessarily a story, story, story. Yeah. In a story, story, yes, but not, not like in the scenario, in, in mm -hmm. a sense, not, not with uh, live pictures. So I, I think this is really important. I mean, for people who perhaps um, uh, either extremely kind of emotional and, and have a lot of passions, um, they sometimes find it difficult to organize their thoughts. And those people, uh, there are sometimes people who are emotionally uh, a little bit underdeveloped or a little bit cold. They also find it difficult to um, to think about emotions in the piece. So I, it's quite useful in this extreme situations on both ends to have, for example, even like labels. It, it sounds extremely primitive, but um, you know, labels for the piece. This is you know a love song. Or you know, this is a I don't know lament. This is um, a, a race. So, so at least they can start somewhere, um, you know, building that story and and, and thinking about uh, emotion because uh, it doesn't always uh, come not to everyone or sometimes people can't decide easily. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, you said that you you think that. Uh, position to sort of make us think. You said there's no such thing as interpretation. So um, that's a sort of answer quite another question about it than that. Do you think there's a, such a thing as a right interpretation or a wrong interpretation? Well I said there's no interpretation of a text. Hmm. Because I you know I think that the text is getting sometimes ignored or sometimes not studied well enough. You know? But um, for example when I was describing the time, I think actually there is this kind of aspect of um, timing, which also includes phrasing, for example, that is elusive, that is not exactly written in. You know, those things, I think this is when the interpretation does come in. This is where, because you will feel a space, every one of us will feel the space very differently. So I think this is when the interpretation comes in. But often, it comes in too early, it replaces all the other things, like actually I've got to do this rhythm correctly, and this has to be on the beat. Uh, you know, if you, if you don't have that base, and you start interpreting, this, this is what, for me, is, a, is a, <laughs> like a red cloth in front of a bull. <laughs> Okay, anybody else has any questions?
Yes? Uh, how do you think that the interpretation of, let's say, Pieris or Violet can change uh, if they, uh, for example, don't listen only to their listeners' repertoire, but they listen to the pieces of the composers they play in much bigger form, mm. aspect? Like mm. They're saying the same thing as their operas and uh, whatever they have, yes. because they are songs, for example. How do you think it can affect their interpretation? Hmm. I think but it's so a very good question because because um, you, you, what musicians need and, and all artists is, is imagination, and I think uh, listening to um, same composer, for example, that you're working on, but to different pieces, to either operas or symphonic works or chamber works actually enlarges your imagination about which things. I think first of all about sound because um, it gives you many ideas about which colors you can use. I mean, not to go far, but you know there is always this argument about, for example, Baroque music. You know, and some people absolutely insist that the Baroque music on the modern piano should be played as close as possible to the Baroque style or Baroque sound. For example, I don't belong to that school. I think, you know, if Bach had a piano, and he did actually have a piano in his days, he would have probably wrote it, you know, differently. He would have used all the wonderful possibilities that exist on the piano. So, but um, listening to his other works um, can guide you and lead you to the point where you have a different idea and open up your mind about uh, about sound production and um, also about phrasing. Uh, phrasing is very important because, um, uh, for, especially you know, for pianists in this sense, because actually we don't need to breathe anywhere, <laughs> so we don't need to physically breathe. And if, but if we listen to singers or or wood, woodwind instruments or even uh, string instruments, you know, the, the, looking at the bow, how they're working with the bow, it actually uh, makes you think about how you do this phrase, how do you phrase this particular thing. You know, if you were a singer, how would you do that? If you were a violinist, how would you do that? Well, you will take the ball off or on. So it, it, it opens up in kind of into the world of sound and into the world of music. And often I actually find also rhythmical things that sometimes, you know, uh, can be helpful to watch other people do, particularly string players. It's very interesting when they work with dotted rhythms or triplets or they do ricochet. It's, it's very easy to see visually on the string instrument because it's much smaller and somehow much clearer because we've got both hands, we've got pedal, with lots of things going on. So with a, with a string instrument it's clearer to see certain technique and you can actually interpret it on the triad on the piano as well. And I'm sure that uh, for singers, and Susan, please correct me, I'm wrong, but I think listening to instruments, I mean, um, Nicola was playing a recording of a soprano the other day who was with a, singing with a clarinet, I think, I believe, the solo. And the sound, the, the color of the, her voice was exactly pitched, matched to that sound. Not to say even pitched, but also matched, the color was the same. And we also say, you know, to singers, at this point, be a cello. Make a big, you know, make a big bow here, or make a, make a, sing the phrase like a cello would sing it, or like mm -hmm. a violin. Or, you know, we, we often use those images. Yes. You know, and I've spoken to you know cellist friends, for example, mm -hmm. who say well, we sing, we're singing it in our heads mm -hmm. when we're playing. We're actually trying to sing it to get the sort of the pace and the, the mm -hmm. breath that we as singers would take. Yes. Yeah. To get that sense of space. Mm -hmm. Yes, and often also with pianists, <clears throat> because we use both hands and and, uh, and pedals, we actually it helps to hear the balancing of say a string quartet to to be able to um, <clears throat> to find the kind of equal sound. We could ensemble, um, even in Bach fugues, you, know, you can you can think about this um, ensemble of musicians doing it rather than just projecting, say, one voice. Because often, you know, they, they just shout out the, the tema in the fugue and the other voice is just sort of there, being quiet, 
because the teachers say so. But I think if you if you actually listen to the involvement that people have in the string quartet, I have a very talented uh, friend who's um, an artist, and he presented me a drawing of the string quartet. Um, and it's a very funny drawing because the four people and the music stands are left behind them and they merge. <laughs> and the music stands are all in the back of them. <laughs> but these four are completely merged. I think it's a wonderful um, kind of vision of a string quartet in action for good string quartet. Yeah. I also wanted to extend a little bit this thought about interpretation and the sources of interpretation. Because uh, do you believe, I just want to ask uh, you, about it. Do you believe that uh, also a musician uh, should be also must be interested naturally in other uh, arts and to know about it so because this is also a feeling of interpretation mm. and uh, that the cultural side of that is also very important. Do you believe mm. it? Because when I think about the big composers, the great composers of our time or the past time, I know we all know. That they were quite close with uh, uh, painters or writers or poets mm -hmm. and uh, their philosophy was based on knowing all this too, not only on their talent mm -hmm. or their passion to write or their genius, mm -hmm. not only on that. It was based not only on that. Yeah. Uh, so, I do think that in, because I myself, I can feel uh, when they do. Someone who plays whatever instrument or sing, does he or she has this interest or not in the interpretation? I can feel, for example. Hmm. It's yes. actually quite clear sometimes. Yeah. Or follows the instructions of the teacher. Yeah. Well, well, you, yeah. you know, uh, there is, um, uh, unfortunately, we live in the world, particularly in Europe, where the classical music, I think, uh, in some ways, if you look at audiences a little bit, like my personal opinion, in decline. Because if you look at the audiences, they're all of a certain age. <laughs> and I'm always worried that they will <laughs> not, not be around to listen to you. <laughs> um, and I think um, uh, there is this kind of idea that if you're not, sometimes in, in, in Britain, in schools, if you're not good at, uh, at, in school, you can become a musician. And I think it is so, so wrong. Because actually, musicians, um, to be a musician is, is incredibly uh, challenging uh, and deeply satisfying work, but you've got to be a very cultured person. And, and cultured person means that you've actually got to know, uh, you've, got to be, you've got to love to read, you've got to love life, you've got to um, be educated and not just in music. I mean, so many times uh, we, we all talk about physique or physics in music um, that, that, that applies to us. We can talk about, we can discuss about our architecture and connect that very closely to music. So I think, you know, musician is actually somebody who's quite rounded person and, and it's extremely demanding because I, I think there aren't maybe, there are some people who are intuitively incredibly talented um, but there are very few of those, and I think those ones that do come through um, through their work, they they are incredibly interesting people and very cultured. And those people always take imagination or take uh, inspiration from art, but not even art necessarily. I mean, books, you know, and and life, and um, and in, and meeting meeting interesting people. I think what we do here is great because you all come from different uh, walks of life and you all talk to each other and exchange your views. So I think that's a part of it. Yes. Katya, fine. Um, in terms of um, your subject, which is uh, text, time and interpretation, and what you're saying about being true to the text before you start to put your interpretation on top of it, um, there are some texts which are very limited, you know, in, in terms of what they say. Um, there are texts which, are, which go much, much, much further, say, what pedal marking, what dynamics, mm -hmm. maybe even what fingering they suggest, you know. Um, so if you're, if you're going to be true to the text, then you've got to be a huge data processor. And the more complex or more 
more precise the text has been written, it would therefore presumably leave less room for interpretation. So, um, if, is, is it, I guess it must be possible that there's a composer who has such a clear idea about what he wants to write, that he might in fact not just write everything down in real detail, but maybe provide a little story, I mean, we see Debussy with his preludes, he gives you a, an idea about what, what he's, uh, he's doing there, but maybe, you know, and, and you get colours that are suggested to you, so, you know, you can almost say, as you say, that wasn't purple, that was yellow, oh, purple, you know. Um, so, you know, if, if you're data processing to the point whereby you're, you're being absolutely true to the text, the, the, the more articulate the text is, the less room there is to interpretation. And if you go one stage further than that, and let's say if you go to a live recording by the composer himself, then presumably that is what he wanted, and therefore that's the only interpretation that you can have. Mm -hmm. so, well, I see what you're saying, but you know, the, you know what happened at the beginning of the 20th century, that uh, the composers were really worried, I think, with people playing their works badly or in, you know, doing wrong things, and they started writing a lot of information. So if you look at uh, you know, Rachmaninoff's course, there's a lot of very, very detailed information that is written in there. And, and sometimes um, it's also, it's a very good point, it's also very easy to get completely bogged down by it. Because you, all you're doing is you're just reading, you know, accents, this type of accent, this type of accent, here are the staccatos, and here. So you've got to almost like step back and look at musical idea. What is he trying to say? Because the, I, I think to some extent, notation or, or, or writing, uh, uh, presenting a manuscript is not perfect. It's, it's not been perfect before, it's not perfect now either. It's very difficult to absolutely, in, in exact detail, to put a sound ball together on a piece of paper. Is it possible? Has anybody tried I don't know. To... <laughs> I don't think it's possible. But I think there is, you know, in, in some composers you have very little, and some you have almost too much. Uh, you know, and for a person who hasn't experienced a lot of that music with a lot of details, it, it can get overwhelming. Yeah. In that respect, I, I mean, I've just been working, I will be working again with the Mark Anthony Turnage, and he, he, I'm doing a piece of his that he wrote in the 1980s, and I said to him when we were working, I said, you know, all these marks, it's like four bars, and there's a million, he said, I just put them all in because I didn't know how to write it down. Mm -hmm. So I just thought if I gave lots and lots and lots of signals, that you would, somebody would react to one of those and it would be the right thing. That was his honest, you know, he said if I was writing it now, 30 years later, I would have probably been much more uh, minimal mm -hmm. than I would have probably known how to do it. But at the time he was a young, he was 20 something, he just, Shuffle all this information on the page. Yeah. So for uh, 30 years, everybody's been scratching their head going, what? You know? <laughs> yeah. But that, I mean, you're taking that and extending that, that, that idea, that does suggest that perhaps a composer would write something thinking that this is exactly what he wants to have, and then somebody might come along and perform it, and he'll say, that's even better than I thought. Oh, yeah. oh it, it happens all the time. Yeah. And also, you mentioned um, recordings by, um, right. by composers, yeah. and uh, the, the problem is that some old composers, we have very few recordings and nowadays we're so spoiled because we can compare the same person in uh, like the wine, yeah. you know, in 1960, in the 1980s, in the 1990s, and they would be singing the same song and the song would be differently presented. So you, you, it's a little bit, I think, risky just to take any kind of old composition played by the composer as a given permit because you don't know exactly at which point it happens. You don't know, you know, how it developed. You might have changed his mind. But I think it's a, as a historical document, as a sort of document to be respected and thought about, it's, it's very important. I'm sure that, you know, the singing has undergone a huge evolution yeah. since. Uh, you watch Richard Strauss conduct. Hmm. It's like he's just, you know, conducting a village band. Hmm. You know, he has no, there's none of this big drama that you would expect from these big pieces. Hmm. It's very, like, it's 
very simple, very clean, almost detached. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's why in a sense, this is what I'm also saying, you know, you've got to stick to the text because in a sense this is a bit of a Bible, really. Mm -hmm. Manolis. Well, I just wanted to add, since we're talking about it, we do have many examples in the 20th century of composers performing their own works, not observing everything that we see in their own texts. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And not because they were, Rachmaninoff was not technically uh, failing when he was doing many of his recordings. It was a choice. Um, and I would add that we have many instances of composers who very much liked other interpretations of their own works, other interpretations than their own. That's documented. So that adds a little bit of confusion. <laughs> to the story about something is not absolute, we have the text, yeah. that's what we have on hand, but there's a lot hmm. to look around it, yeah. right? Well, recently uh, with a couple of my students I was involved in a project in St. John's Smith Square with uh, Stephen Montague's works, and uh, Stephen actually teaches at Trinity as well, and uh, they both went and played to him. And uh, there were some ideas that you know we've discovered that he didn't know existed in his score, and he said, "Oh, really like this. <laughs> uh, really like what you're doing here, and I can I can just keep doing this." So this is a, a very fluid process. W what again? I, I will say that again. What I am always worried, and I, I think maybe more in my teaching shoes, is that this process shouldn't take time too early. <laughs> I think it should um, be given some time, the, the score, the composer need to be given more time to really think about it, you know, uh, and in, in, in Singer's case, uh, it's, it, it applies as well, and, and some things, I, get, I guess things like breathing, it's not breathing, am I right? Yeah, yeah. so the, there are always this kind of grey areas where you want to think about it, but you have, guys, a little bit easier than us because you have a text. And, and, but even within the text, sometimes you have to take a breath in the middle of the sentence or even between two words. So you've got to really you know, think about this and, and compare and listen to recordings. It's, it requires really intellectual work. Um, so I would encourage you to do that rather than come to lessons and bring something and say, oh, this is my interpretation. <laughs> uh, which. As I explained to you, I, I, I always have this kind of worry point, point of it. I mean, I, for example, I had one student that sometimes they say, you know, well, I really like doing this. And he played, you know, they called the second movement, sonata. And he, he just sort of went, and then, <laughs> and he said, what's wrong with the pedal? Why is the pedal over lapping? And he said, I really like that. <laughs> so how do you deal with that? <laughs> you, you, this is the question, you know. It doesn't know the composer. Yes, so and if somebody doesn't listen to, you, for example, the string quartet playing, I mean, it's, it's impossibility. If you were to orchestrate it, <laughs> it it's exactly, it, it's impossible uh, to, do, to do that. Whereas, uh, you know, blending with the pedal in, in other composers will make perfect sense. So I think we need to, I think we need to, Study and really analyze and think kind of intellectually um, quite a lot to, to be able to really present a convincing version. It doesn't mean you have to be completely stay off from your emotions. Emotions are very important because they will also guide you. And something you, if you did it, I often find sometimes when the student presents something they just didn't think about the character of this piece. It, once they actually understand what it is and they try to put the feeling, it always changes. Okay, because again, of the physical phenomenon of your body, of your muscles, tone, of uh, how much or how long you want to um, stay on a certain note, or uh, how much crescendo you want to do. I and mean, these things are not written, it says crescendo, but how much is sometimes hard to judge as well. Um, I think that was the point. Yes. Uh, I would like to ask a question. Uh, for some young musicians, I ask, uh, when we are tempted to do some colors or nuances in a phrase, 
most of the time we use we sacrifice time to do that, but it will affect the overall pulse. So if you you are a pianist, but how can you strive a balance between taking excessive time to achieve that particular color or a sound, but, uh, of, and um, keep the pulse right? How can you strive balance to do that? Um, uh, my teacher, I had a very good teacher when I was um, ages sort of 15 to 19 and he always um, said to me when whatever you do time is the last resource so try to make um, expression work with colors or with uh, dynamics or with sound first before you touch the time before you think about the time because the thing is that music is something that, that lives in time. I mean, we, we are very harmonic, naturally balanced people because you have a heartbeat, you know, we are symmetrical in most cases, <laughs> you know. And so we, it's, it's in our voice. So we often, when you go to concerts, for example, and somebody loses the sense of pulse and then just be, either music comes to halt or it just rushes ahead, it, you don't actually feel comfortable. You physically feel uncomfortable. Um, so I would say look at other things, you know, is there something you can do with articulation, is there something you can do with um, uh, within the, the beat, you know, perhaps lingering on the first or on, the, on the, a particular note, um, but rather than just, you know, changing or taking too much time, because it has to be balanced. So try other, other ways. First, that would be my advice. Yes. Um, what if the two conflict? So, um, say you have a, a passage which is has a specific tempo marking and, and everyone plays at a different tempo. Who do you go with? With nobody. You don't go with anyone. Because the thing is that if you look at passage and then listen to different people playing it differently or different speed, you know, because all it says, for example, is allegro. You know, how do you, how, how, what's fast? It depends on ear, it depends on uh, you know, the piece itself, depends on what was before, it depends on what was after. But I think you need to construct your own story and you need to construct your own um, kind of changes of tempi and your own tempo that will then affect others. So it depends on your structure, because all these people you're listening to, they've created their own idea of a structure, and I think within that idea, it, it may work, or it may not work, but at least they try to build the structure. And also, this is quite a, can be quite dangerous because sometimes, um, I mean, it's, it's wonderful and important to listen to recordings, but sometimes we can take away one idea from a recording and use it. But you mustn't forget that this idea came in the combination with others. It came from a bigger picture. So what you did is just you kind of grabbed something and you kind of plastered it. And it may not work for you. It may not work with what you're doing because it's not your story. Does that make sense? <laughs> so, so it's good to listen to somebody, but if you like something, particular moment that they did, you've got to then try to unwind it and try to understand why did they do that? How did they build this? What, what was the thought process behind it? You know, and then I think this is more, much more useful way to listen to recordings because then you can apply it to your own playing. But coming and saying, you know, oh, well, you know, Alicia de Rocha doesn't like this, you know. <laughs> it really doesn't mean very much, because it's her story. Does that 